Hello and welcome to Solutions. This is the fourth episode of our third series of podcasts for solution-focused hypnotherapists. And I'm Cathy Eland. And I'm Trevor Eddles, and we're both experienced solution-focused hypnotherapists. Today, we're looking at the vagus nerve. So Trevor, why the vagus nerve? Well, it's because it's such a big nerve that goes all over the body and seems to affect so many things that ultimately affect how we feel and behave. Okay, that sounds important. So tell us some more information about the vagus nerve. Firstly, vagus means wanderer. The word has the same root as the word vagabond. The nerve originates in the brainstem. It's the 10th cranial nerve and goes to the lungs, heart, gut, liver, salivary glands and kidneys. Uh, The vagus nerve affects heart rate, breathing rate, gastrointestinal peristalsis, sweating, detoxification, and much else. It also controls a few skeletal muscles, including muscles responsible for swallowing, as well as phonation, uh, that's producing sound through vibrations, and speech. Interesting. Shall I quickly recap on the nervous system? Well, we have the central nervous system, the brain and spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, the other nerves. The peripheral nervous system is divided into sensory or afferent nerves, they're linked to your senses, and motor or efferent nerves, which tells muscles and glands what to do. These motor nerves are divided into somatic or voluntary nerves, that's the ones that you can control, and autonomic or involuntary nerves, the ones you can't control. And autonomic nerves are divided into sympathetic nerves, that's the fight and flight, and the parasympathetic nerves, the rest and digest. There's also the enteric nervous system, which supplies the GI tract and is a quasi-autonomous part of the autonomic nervous system. Right. Okay, great. So the vagus nerve is actually made up of lots of nerve fibres. 80% are efferent fibres that regulate muscles, peristalsis of the gut, sweating, heart rate, blood pressure, speech, eating and more. And 20% are afferent or sensory nerves bringing messages to the brain. Now, some nerves are myelinated. That means they've got that myelin sheath wrapped around them, and some aren't. And that makes them slower at transmitting messages. So the vagus nerve is branched and is the longest autonomic nerve in the body. Okay, wow. And also the vagus nerve plays a big part in the gut-brain axis, or the GBA. This is a communication network in both directions between the brain and the gut. Evidence from animal studies suggests that gut microorganisms, or the biome, can activate the vagus nerve and that such activation plays a critical role in mediating effects on the brain and behaviour. At the same time, our mind, or our thoughts and emotions, affect our gut health and microbiome through the vagus nerve. Stress inhibits the signals sent through the vagus nerve and causes gastrointestinal problems. Poor vagus nerve function explains why stress suppresses stomach acid and digestive enzyme production, increasing gut permeability, which is leaky gut, and reducing the migrating motor complex, a pattern of electrical activity observed in the gastrointestinal tract, in a regular cycle during fasting, which is thought to be the main cause of small intestine bacterial overgrowth, or SIBO, a disorder of excessive bacterial growth in the small intestine that is associated with symptoms such as nausea, bloating, vomiting, diarrhea, malnutrition, weight loss, and malabsorption. Wow, gosh. Okay, let's look at the body's immune system for a moment. It's there to protect your body from invading bacteria, etc. For example, a cut finger will result in white cells in the blood coming to surround the invading bacteria. It also results in some swelling around the cut. And this swelling, the inflammation, is associated with immune responses. 
Inflammation can also result from stress, bereavement, poverty, debt, social isolation, maltreatment as a child, being overweight, and other one-off stressful events. Cytokines are released during inflammation. They're small proteins used in cell signaling. They can cause damage to cells around the site of the inflammation. The vagus nerve can sense cytokine levels and signals the brain. The brain will then use the vagus nerve to tell the spleen to produce fewer white cells and reduce the cytokine levels. This is called the inflammatory reflex. The cholinergic anti-inflammatory pathway is the name given to the efferent or motor arm of the inflammatory reflex. People often talk about vagal tone, and this refers to how well the vagus nerve is functioning. It's usually measured indirectly, e.g. by measuring the amount of time between heartbeats. The more active the vagus nerve is, the better the vagal tone. Vagal tone affects how well inflammation is reduced. This is important because inflammation is associated with illnesses such as allergy, asthma, autoimmune disease, celiac disease, glomerular nephritis, hepatitis, inflammatory bowel disease, and others. And inflammation has been linked with depression. That is interesting. And so the vagus nerve and therefore vagal tone are important in controlling inflammation and inflammatory diseases. Yeah. And when immune cells first detect the presence of pathogenic or toxic agents in the gut, the vagus nerve will stimulate the thymus, which is found in children, and the spleen to increase their activity. At the same time, a stress response and the sympathetic nerves are activated, which causes the release of the neurotransmitter noradrenaline. This in turn causes the immune system to be highly reactive to the threat. When the threat has been dealt with, the vagus nerve turns off the unneeded immune response. The vagus nerve sends out the neurotransmitter acetylcholine in the gut and other parts of the body. But So obviously, if vagal tone is low, then the immune response will not be completely turned off. Yeah, and that's quite important. Anyway, moving on, tell us about the polyvagal theory. Okay, I will. Dr. Stephen Porges in 1995 came up with the polyvagal theory. Porges suggested that some medical conditions are a result of competition between the vagus nerves, malleated and non-malleated nerve fibres because they have opposite effects on the same organ. Now, according to the polyvagal theory, our nervous system has more than one defense strategy and they are all outside our conscious awareness. Firstly, the freeze response, the unmalleated vagus responds to threats by depressing metabolic activity. We use it when we experience a severe injury. It shuts us down and turns off our registration of pain. The second is the fight and flight response. This depends on the functioning of the sympathetic nervous system, increasing metabolic output. And the third and most interesting option is communication and uses mammalian malleated vagus. It can rapidly regulate cardiac output to calm you down and is associated with cranial nerves that regulate sociability through facial expressions and vocalization. The newer responses, in evolutionary terms, inhibit the older ones. People use the newer circuit to promote calm states, to self-soothe and engage. When the parasympathetic nervous system is dominant, higher order cognitive functioning is possible, which enables a wider and more flexible range of behavior. If that doesn't work, they can use the sympathetic adrenal system for fight and flight. When the sympathetic nervous system is dominant, social behavior is limited to survival strategies such as aggression, avoidance or withdrawal. And if that's not possible or not working, the old vagal system can be used to freeze or to shut us down. 
Wow. So how does the nervous system know to try to communicate social engagement rather than fight or flight? Well, it needs to assess the risk and then inhibit the more primitive behavior. The nervous system processes sensory information from the environment and viscera without any conscious awareness, although it may involve subcortical limbic structures. This is called neuroception, to emphasize that it's a neural process, not a perception. Social engagement connects the social muscles of the face, the eyes, mouth, and middle ear with the heart. We use this to clear up misunderstandings, get help, ask for forgiveness, etc. It's interesting. And according to A.D. Craig, or Bud to his friends, emotions come from feelings in our organs and gut. And these feelings are sent using the vagus nerve to the anterior insular cortex, or the AIC, in the brain. The AIC stores these feelings as a series of snapshots, and this makes up our working emotional memory. These feelings are integrated with the social exchange to give us an emotional response to what's happening around us, as well as a safety strategy. So if our clients are feeling anxious with everyday life, perhaps the solution is in their vagus nerve. Mm, yes. Yeah. So um, the suggested benefits of vagus nerve stimulation are that it reduces inflammation, it helps create new brain cells, it lifts your mood, it improves memory, it increases immunity, it increases the level of endorphins, which reduces the sensation of pain. Goodness. So how can you tell if your vagal tone is low, you are asking yourselves? Apart from feeling ill, here are some examples. You have difficulty speaking or you lose your voice. Your voice is hoarse or wheezy. You have trouble drinking liquids. You lose your gag reflex. You have abnormal heart rate or blood pressure. You have decreased stomach acid and or digestive enzymes. You have abdominal bloating or pain. Your bowel transit time is less than 10 hours or more than 20 hours, often resulting in diarrhea or constipation. And finally, you have gastroparesis, which is where the stomach can't empty itself of food in a normal fashion. Hmm, yuck. How can you stimulate and improve your vagal tone? Bottom-up approaches include yoga, tai chi, ti jong. 15 to 20 minutes is sufficient to get the benefits provided. This is done regularly. Remember that breath is more important than the movement in these practices. Deep, slow breathing, a deep, diaphragmatic belly breath followed by a long, slow exhale, causes the vagus nerve to release acetylcholine into muscles, which has a calming effect and can improve performance where calmness is important. Singing, humming, chanting. It can be enthusiastic enough to cause your voice box to vibrate. And of course, you can do this in the car. <laughs> Gargling. But this really needs to be vigorous in about two minutes at a session. Take a cold shower. Just start with five or ten seconds just at the end of the shower and build up to a few minutes. Perhaps one to two minutes is very good. In fact, any exposure to cold can be good. Gag reflex. Stimulate the reflex by touching the back of your tongue or your soft palate with your toothbrush. The reflex must be strong. Uh, then there's sunlight. Expose your skin to sunlight first thing in the morning and or during the day. Well, assuming the rain stops. Yes, indeed. Take a walk in nature uh, for at least 20 to 30 minutes at a time. Yeah. And try sleeping on your side. Interesting. And top down approaches include. Meditation. Psychotherapy. Positive social interaction, the emphasis being on positive and feeling safe. Expressing gratitude. 
Craniosacral therapy. Biofeedback. My favourite, laughter. Prayer. And of course, exercise. So clearly the vagus nerve has an important role in the body in terms of health. So it's important that clients are as healthy as possible in order to make the other changes they want in their lives. Anyway, that's about it from us. I hope that gives you some idea about the vagus nerve and vagal tone and what you might suggest to clients to try. Yeah, brilliant. And next time we'll be looking at new theories about how the brain works. So until then, it's goodbye from me, Cathy Eland. And it's goodbye from me, Trevor Eddles. See you next time. Bye. Bye.